In this lecture, I'll be talking about dimension, rank, and nullity. So we've been talking about subspaces and bases for those subspaces. So remember that a basis for a subspace H is a linearly independent set of vectors that spans H. And so in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the dimension of that subspace. So the dimension of a subspace is the number of vectors in any basis for H. Now remember that we talked about a special subspace, which is kind of boring. It only contains the zero vector, but that still satisfies all the definitions. So that counts as a subspace, but there's no basis for that subspace. So in that case, we would say the dimension of that subspace is zero. One of the things that's assumed by the definition of dimension is that two different bases of the same subspace would have to have the same number of vectors. So what we wouldn't want to have happen is to have a subspace with one basis with two vectors in it and another basis for that same subspace that had three vectors in it. What would the dimension of that subspace be? We wouldn't have any way of defining that. So it turns out that that can't happen. Anytime you have a subspace, any basis for that subspace, no matter what basis it is, they all have to have the same number of vectors. So we want to try to understand why that's true. So I'm going to go through a proof of that fact in this lecture and just try to explain how those ideas work. But before we can do that, we have to prove a theorem that's going to help us do that. So here's the theorem. It says if you have a subspace of Rn and a basis for H, then any set of Q vectors with Q greater than P. Okay, so P here is the number of vectors in the basis. And then we're saying we have some other set of vectors, Q vectors in H with Q greater than P. So that means we have more vectors in this set that we're talking about than we do in the basis. So the theorem here says that that set of Q vectors has to be linearly dependent. In other words, there has to be a dependence relation among those vectors. Okay, so how's this proof gonna work? Well, this proof is about any set of Q vectors, right? The proof is saying something about that thing. So we're gonna start our proof by saying, all right, let's suppose someone hands us a set of Q vectors in H. So we'll call those vectors Vs. So the V vectors, those are the mysterious vectors that we're trying to find out something about. The B vectors, that's our basis, right? So B is a basis, which means we know a lot about it. And in particular, one of the things we can do with that basis is find coordinates for any vector in H. And so that's what we're going to do. So remember this notation here. So V1 in a bracket with a subscript B, this means the coordinates of v1 in the or relative to the basis b so in other words we can write v1 as a linear combination of the b vectors and the coefficients the weights that we get when we do that we call those coordinates okay so we're going to take those coordinate vectors for each of the v vectors and write a vector equation with those vectors as the vectors in the vector equation those coordinate vectors all right, so that vector equation, let's think about what that is, okay? So it's got Q variables. We can see those, right, X1 through XQ. But what about the vectors themselves? Well, B is a basis with P vectors in it, which means when we find the coordinates of this V vector, there's gonna be one coordinate for each basis vector, which means this vector is in RP because we've got one coordinate in that coordinate vector for each basis vector. So the corresponding matrix for this vector equation has P rows and Q columns. Let's forget the zero vector, right? So let's not worry about that. Very often when we solve homogeneous equations, we leave off the last zero column anyway. So the corresponding matrix here, we call it A, has P rows and Q columns. So in other words, the matrix equation we're talking about is AX equals zero. This is the coefficient matrix. All right, so let's think about that though. We know that Q is more than P, right? This set of vectors that somebody handed us has more vectors in it than we had in our basis, which means this matrix has more columns than it has rows. And that means that it can't have a pivot in every column. There's more columns than rows and each pivot has to get its own row which means this matrix has to have at least one column with no pivot in it. And that means that AX equals zero has at least one non-trivial solution. But that non-trivial solution is gonna give us a dependence relation among those coordinate vectors. But those coordinate vectors are gonna have the same exact dependence relation 
as my original basis vectors because this correspondence that we talked about, if you remember, we called this an isomorphism. That correspondence is going to take those coefficients of, of whatever that dependence relation is and carry them back and give us a dependence relation for the V vectors. And that's a contradiction because the original V vectors have to be linearly independent and this would say that they were linearly dependent. So that contradiction proves the theorem. A little bit abstract, but hopefully some of that made sense. Okay, so how does that help us see why dimension is well-defined? Well, let's suppose that we had two bases for the same subspace. So in this case, let's say we had basis B, which has P vectors in it, and basis C, which has Q vectors in it. And let's say that they didn't have the same number of vectors. Let's say that Q was greater than P. You can see how this relates to the theorem that we just talked about. Well, that theorem would tell us that C, this set of Q vectors, would have to be linearly dependent. But wait a second, it's supposed to be a basis. Basis means that it's linearly independent. That would be a contradiction. And that contradiction means that this can't happen. You can't have two bases with different numbers of vectors in them. And so then the notion of dimension, which remember is the number of vectors in a basis, that notion is well-defined. All right, so there's more that we could say about bases. I'm not gonna go through the proof of this theorem, but this again gives you some more information. This says that if you have a subspace with dimension P, then any linearly independent subset of H with P elements, so it's a linearly independent set, it's got the right number of elements, that turns out that that's enough to say that it's a basis. In other words, we wouldn't have to prove that this set spans this subspace. And I've got some bullet points here to sort of walk you through the proof. But again, hopefully that makes some, some sense to you. Okay, a couple of the definitions. So if we have a matrix, N by M matrix, N rows, M columns, the rank of A is the dimension of the column space of A. So that's just a special name for the dimension of that special subspace. The nullity of A is the dimension of the null space of A. So again, just a special name for the dimension of that special subspace. And it turns out that we have this nice relationship called the rank nullity theorem, which says that if you take the rank of A and add it to the nullity of A, then what we get is M, which is the number of columns of A. Now I could go through a proof of this for you, but it's actually pretty easy. And to show you why, let's go through an example. All right, so we have a matrix here. And what I want you to do is compute the rank, compute the nullity, and then verify the rank nullity theorem. So remember this matrix A is three by four. We can see that it's got three rows and four columns. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna row reduce this matrix. Remember that to find an actual basis for the rank and the nullity, both of those require us to row reduce this matrix. So we're gonna row reduce A, and in this case, it turns out to be one, negative two, zero, negative two, zero, zero, one, negative two, zero, 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 zero. Okay, so let's think about rank. So remember the rank is the dimension of the column space of A. But if we actually wanted to find a basis for the column space of A, what would we do? Well, we would try to find the pivot columns of A. And we can see that when we row reduce our matrix, the first and third columns have pivots. And that means that the first and third columns of A are the pivot columns of A. And that means that this dimension is the number two. Because that basis, we can actually see the basis. It's right here. This vector and this vector, these vectors I've circled in green, those vectors are the basis for the column space of A. And it's got two vectors in it, so that means the dimension is two. What about the nullity? Well, to find the nullity, it's not quite as obvious, but what we need to do is solve AX equals zero and look for the number of free variables. Remember that when we find our solution to AX equals zero and write it in parametric solution form, the number of free variables is gonna tell us the number of vectors that we get. Well, the number of free variables corresponds to the number of non-pivot columns in our row reduced matrix. This means that x2, which corresponds to that, that column, and x4, which corresponds to that column, those are gonna be my free variables when I go to solve ax equals zero. So that means that the nullity of a here is two because I have two non-pivot columns. So the rank nullity theorem says that the rank of a plus the nullity of A has to equal the number of columns of A. And in this case, we can clearly see that two plus two equals four. 
But why does this work in general? Well, the rank of A, that's the number of pivot columns of A. The nullity of A, that's the number of non-pivot columns of A. And so why does that equal the number of columns of A? Well, hopefully that's pretty clear. So that's all the rank nullity theorem is saying. So it's actually quite a, a nice, but uh, pretty easy to understand result. So hopefully this example made sense. Hopefully you followed some of the steps of the proofs that we talked about earlier in this lecture, and I'll see you next time.